The first thing we're going to do is get EDA. Everybody at this point knows EDA means exploratory data analysis. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get correlation, scatter plots, and contingency tables will be provided to show what the sample data contains for the response and predictors. So I'm um, going to um, come over to our initial Excel workbook. Go all the way over, if you don't mind, please, to the very top first worksheet, ARDS full. So this is just our analysis ready data set that we've been um, kind of working on for a while, so several assignments now. All right, so I want you to start there. And then the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull out from this, the numerical data, and we're gonna put it in the second worksheet. So you can do this whatever way you're comfortable with doing it. I'm just gonna show you the way I'm gonna do it, which is to copy everything from Artsful by hitting that little triangle in the upper left corner. Um, and copying this data into numerical data. And then I'm gonna start deleting what's not numerical. That's just, to me, the easiest way to do it, but you can do it any way you want. So um, this is gonna take us all the way back to the first week of the semester. So this assignment, this whole assignment, in a sense, the final's not cumulative, but the assignment and doing the work in is inherently cumulative, in a sense, okay? Um, so, Customer ID, is that a numerical data? Okay, they're numbers, but how do you decide if it's numerical? Well, one way is does zero mean a lack of being having a customer ID? Another question you could ask is if you subtract two of these numbers, does the difference tell you anything meaningful about the customers? No. So this is actually like a last name. It's a unique identifier. So it's not numerical. So we're going to delete it. So um, you just delete that whole column out. Okay, and then there's some that I hope you kind of know more right off the bat. I'm hoping one thing you walk away at the end of the semester is you know there's a difference between numerical and categorical variables and what that is. So we're gonna get rid of sex, race, and birth date, I'm gonna say go ahead and get rid of it because we have age, which we derive from birth date and that's more useful. Um, college, yes, no. All right, so let's delete all those. All right, household size, that's numerical. Okay, what about zip code? Is zip code a categorical or is it numerical? Sorry, I got a fuzz in my hand. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. So what do you guys think? Yeah. Categorical. Yes, because if you take a difference, if you subtract one zip code from another, you're not really measuring anything. That right? It's not like how many miles apart your town is. Okay, so zip code we don't want. So let's delete that. All right. Um, all right, the next one, uh, satisfaction channel. Those are delete, we're gonna delete those. Those aren't numerical. Um, all right, then we get over to RF and M. What do you guys think about RF and M? RF and M are what? Remember those numbers, one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, three, four, five, that represent the quintiles that the customer's in for each one of those factors that we care about for being a good customer. And um, they are kind of like borderline numerical, if you will, but they're really not. They're really actually bin names, like which quintile the person's in. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of that. And um, RF and M, what about that one? Well, let me ask you this. Which is a better customer? 155? Or 222, two, two. which is a better customer, 155 or 222? Two, two. Because remember, this is the higher the number, it's a cat. It's, it tells you in three different dimensions if they're a strong customer, five being the best. So a 155 means you, you're a really strong customer in two out of three factors. So that's a better customer than a 222. Two, two. Right? But numerically, 222 is higher than 155. So that's kind of how you figure out that there's this is not numerical data. Okay, it's categorical as well. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and delete that one. But RFM average is perfectly great and useful to us. All right, I suspect you guys would know to get rid of income bin, membership and race reduced. So we're going to delete those as well. And then we get to the dummy variables. Now, the dummy variables are zero ones. We call those binary. 
zero one binary data is um, technically numerical, right? It's the whole reason we made it. We wanted to take categorical values and turn them into numerical. But the thing about them is that because it's just a zero one, they work in this kind of like, they don't work as well as other numerical. For the purposes of finding of this first part, we're gonna go ahead and delete those. All right. Once you have your numerical data set up in here, I want you to take your spending 2221. That's our response variable. Everything we're trying to do is predict that number for any particular customer. We're gonna figure out what is predictive of that number, those numbers. So we wanna put always the spent the response at the very left in our data. So we're gonna um, move that. Now you can move it any way you like. You guys know Excel, move your column over to column A. I'm gonna just show you a little trick in Excel. You can hover, so you get a four pointed arrow. And then I hold down my shift key and I drag it over and I can move it that way. But you can do it any way that works for you. All right, the next thing that we found if you've done assignments eight and nine is that we always have to do these scatter plots and we always want the response variable on the Y axis. So it's always good to have a copy of our response variable on the right. So I'm gonna put a copy of this on the right. I thought I was. Well, somehow I didn't get it right. Okay. So now let's come over to numerical EDA. So just to be clear, if I had to take all the instructions in this last assignment, I could you could kind of put them into four categories. The first one, find the candidate predictors. This has got more work in it. A lot of the work is sort of repetitive, but we have to find our candidate predictors. Then we're gonna run regression analysis. This is the more fun part. This is where you gotta actually try to figure out your best model. Once that's done, we're gonna use the final model to make predictions. And this last bit is where we're gonna actually convert it to a strategy for how, to, how we would recommend to Catherine Hill to increase revenues. That's data driven, all right? So we're here in the first one, find candidate predictors. We're gonna break that down into, into two types, find numerical predictors and find categorical predictors. So the first thing here in this slide, if you see this table over here, um, you might, if you wanna highlight it in yellow, you can. This is what you have to have done. You gotta fill this table out by the time you're done with this worksheet, all right? So it's not, it's an unfinished table, it involves but figuring out what are your numerical predictors and are there any, there's no numbers that are gonna go in this table. It's just gonna be the names of predictors. Do you have any predictors that are possibly multicollinear that you would swap one out for the other? Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna do, if you also wanna highlight this part in yellow is I went ahead and, and this, I've said this in class, um, but I just wanna, and it's been in the notes I think, so I just wanna make sure it's super clear that the threshold we wanna do use for looking at um, correlation coefficients in our predictors, in our candidate predictors, um, is at least an absolute value of the correlation coefficient of greater than 0.15. Right, so I left you space here. You're gonna create the correlation matrix in here, okay? And we're going to identify in that first column, just like you did in the um, homework assignments eight and nine, that first column, you're gonna look and highlight in yellow anything that's greater in absolute value than a 0.15. So we're hold the bar is really low. We're gonna include all possibilities when we're looking for candidates, okay? Um, so for example, if you get a, a correlation coefficient of negative 0.58, that means it's absolute value 0.58. So we would include that one, right? So don't exclude negative ones. Negative ones are great, as long as they're more negative than negative 0.15. Right, now what I've also told you, and we've done it in, in exercises eight and nine and in the class notes and the class videos ad nauseum, I think, is every time we get a correlation coefficient, we don't trust it unless we do a scatter plot and put a trend line, make sure it is following a line, right? 
So you're going to confirm that. Once you have that done, then you're going to explore the possibility if you have multicollinearity. All right, so multicollinearity, just like we did for the last homework assignment, you're going to look not in the first column of correlation coefficients when you have the matrix. You're going to look at if there's two predictors, and you don't have to look at all of them. You only have to look at the ones that you've identified as possible candidates if they're collinear with another one. Okay, and you're going to do a scatter plot on that. For that, the bar is a little higher. We're looking at correlation coefficients of point in absolute value of 0.7 or more. Okay, if you do have two that are collinear, so like let's say you had, um, you find that you you have two that you thought were going to be in your full model, but they're collinear. You got to put one. Um, so predictor one, predictor two. You got to actually decide which ones you're going to put in the full model. That's a judgment call. That's not going to be wrong or right. Like, I'm not going to, there's not one right answer, so I guess what I'm saying. Either one is fine. You just, but you can't have both of them in the model at the same time. Okay. So after you do that, we're going to explore categorical predictors. So I created a pivot table for you already with all the data. You can use this pivot table to try to find your categorical predictors. So if you come over to categorical EDA, I started this for you. So if you want to highlight this table here, this is what you have to have filled out by the time you're done. Okay. So the goal is to identify the candidate categorical predictors of spending, right? So that means we're going to put our categorical predictors on the rows and we're going to put average spending. Next, we're going to find the average spending next to them, right? Um, so let's go in and set up the first one, um, sex and average spending of 2021. So whoops, go to the pivot table. And um, if you don't already have it set up, grab sex and bring it down to the um, rows and then grab average, I mean, spending 2021 and to the values. Now the problem is it's going to auto default to sum. I've complained about this the whole semester. I wish this auto def defaulted to average because that's really what you want. If you leave sum in there, it's going to be wrong. So we're going to switch the sum to average by going to value field settings and getting the average. All right. Then we're going to copy that result into our categorical EDA. So I copied it and formatted it. And then I made a bar chart because that's the appropriate way to view this. Notice I put data labels on those bars. Okay, so what am I looking for? You're looking for a big difference between one bar or one of the bars to be different. Now, you could also pick a bar that's really low. Like let's say you have a, let's say you have race and all the race I have the bars are about the same height, but like for some reason Hispanic's really low. That's great. If you have one that's really different that can identify something, even if it's a low average, doesn't have to be high. Now, in this case, because there's only two values, male and female, and they're separated, I can pick either one. The way my brain works is I tend to always want to think in the positive. So, like, what is increasing sales? So, I pick female. Okay? I could have picked male. I'm just picking female because the data shows they're spending more. So, I now add female here. Because I think I've, I've picked one of the variable sex and picked one of them, I think, as a predictor. Okay? All right, so then we're going to do the same thing with college. So if we go back over to the pivot table, make sure you know how to do this, right? We're going to take sex out, and we're going to replace it with college. And you got to go through all of them. Don't skip any. I'm skipping them on purpose because I want you to go back and do it. Um, I think I have this auto-filtered. I had set this up at one point. You can... You can um, do the little drop down up here and add unknown back in if you want. All right, it's automatically going to average spending because I didn't change that. So that's great. I'm going to copy that table in here. And so I got my little table of average spending and then I'm going to do a bar chart. And I notice on here that these two are about the same height. But yes was kind of pops out. So I'm going to pick yes, college educated seems to be predictive of spending, more spending. 
So I've added that one over here. Yes, college. So I'm going to need to make a dummy variable for that. Because if you remember, we had already a dummy variable for female, one zero. We don't have one for college educated. So we'll have to add that. Okay. All right. Once I've gone through and done that, the other thing I need to check is for multicollinearity in my categorical predictors. So I wanted to go over how to do that using college and sex, these two we've identified so far, female. So I'm going to go to the pivot table and I'm going to make a contingency table. I'm going to get rid of this average spending now. And just to match my table, I'll put college in columns and then I'm going to put the other one, sex. So I want to check. I have to do this with between every pair of categorical predictors I find. I want to make sure that they're not all bucketed together in the same, in one, in two values, one for each variable. I'll show you what I mean. Let me just do it. Okay. Um, grab college, we're going to get counts. Okay. Once you get counts, that's a frequency, a contingency table, right? We did this for exam two. We turned this into the percentage of row total or percentage of column total. In order to check for multicollinearity, you're gonna do it both ways. So the first way we're gonna do it for is go up to value field settings and let's change that to show value as, you can go either way, I'll start with um, row, percentage of row total. All right, so I'm gonna copy that table into this categorical EDA and this is the top table I have over here. Okay, notice these tables are the same variables. The difference is this has got 100% on the row totals, and this has got 100% on the column totals. Okay. What I'm looking for, I highlighted the, which ones I'm using as my predictor. So I'm saying sex female is my one predictor here, and, my, and for college, yes, is my other predictor. I see an 86%. If you see anything really strong here, like 80% or more, that's a possible problem. So that looks like a red flag, like maybe we have multicollinearity. It has to work the other way. So now we run it with the totals at the bottom, column percentage of column total. So let's remind ourselves how we do that. We go to the pivot table and we go to the um, count of college or count of whatever you used and go to value field settings. And in that second tab, we're gonna go to show column totals. And then we'll get the numbers with 100% at the bottom of the columns. We're gonna copy that over. And now you see you have hundreds down here. Now notice I selected and highlighted in yellow my two predictors again. Yes for college and female. Oh, I, should, I meant to update that to college, my bad. All right, um, so notice this one's only 37. So that means I have now shut, there's no multicollinearity between them. If it was really high, it would mean that if I told you one of these customers was college educated, you were pretty sure they were female. Or if I tell you it's a female, you're pretty sure they're college educated. That means that they're almost interchangeable, those variables, and the linear regression mechanism can't distinguish which is, uh, which what the effect of the predictor is. So that's why this is a big problem. It's like throwing a monkey wrench into an engine. It like ruins everything. So you got to find out if all, if all of one of the values in a categorical is also all of another value in a different value. Categorical variable, sorry. Okay, so if you find any that are multicollinear, you're going to add them. You're going to decide which one is going to be in the fill model and the other one's going to go in the swap out column, all right? Any questions on that? Okay, so now we have the numerical predictors and we figured out if any of them were multicollinear each other. We have the categorical. We figured out if any of them were um, see multicollinear with each other. And then the third thing is, what about if they're inner multicollinear, uh, numerical, one numerical and one categorical? So we have to look across. Question. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but I don't understand the significance of the second chapter with uh, the column total. So I'm looking to see if I break it down by college, yes or no, if the percentage that are female and yes is the majority of the data. Because up here, when I broke it down by female, the majority of females were college educated. 
So if that goes the other way, then that means if I tell you, if I cover my data and I say, hey, Danny, I picked a record. Guess what? The person was college educated. What do you think they are, male or female? Female, right? Or if I say, hey, I picked another record. This person's a female. What do you think they, they go to college or not? You say, yes, they went to college. So if those are both really high. There's that data sort of interchangeable. One can be substituted for the other with high precision. Does that help? So here. So here, this killed not the, the fact that that was 37, it killed it. That's why I said no multicollinearity was found. Okay. Yeah. If, if they were multicollinear, would you have to like swap put like either female or college into the swap out? Yes. You got it. Either one. Okay. Either one doesn't matter. There's no, I won't, it, I, there's not, I don't expect you to read my mind. <laughs> there's not one that's right and one that's wrong. Because in the end, if it matters, you're going to swap it out and see which one does a better job. Okay. All right. So then we have to compare with each other. So now you're going to copy in your numerical table that you filled out. Whoops. And your categorical table that you've identified. And now we're going to see where our goal is to kind of come up with that final table of all our predictors. All right, so this is the goal, and I'm going to show you how you check. We're going to check if there's multicollinear between a numerical predictor with a categorical. So it's a little bit the way we found the predictors that were categorical to begin with. We take each one of the each one of our predictors that's in our categorical table, and we're going to compare it with the average for females of the numerical predictor one and the average of, for males of numerical predictor one. You're going to compare for every one of your numerical predictors to see if it's possible that we have the same scenario happening. You'd go to your um, pivot table, you put in sex, and then instead of the uh, count of college, instead of average spending, you'd put in the other, you put the numerical predictor and look at the averages for that numerical predictor broken down by those values. And so you should, you should see a large difference between one value and another if they if they are multicollinear. So that's kind of considered the first um, check. If you think so, and you can also do side by side box plots. Um, and what you see if it's multicollinearity uh, is that um, the box plots, the box itself is separate from. The two boxes are separate, like the um, edges don't cross over if you look on the y-axis. Whereas this, they kind of overlap. See the red lines? That, that, that's not multicollinear. Multicollinear is all one or the other when you're looking at the average of the, uh, the data, the numerical data. All right. And I'll just tell you a heads up. There aren't very many of that. There's not that, that much of that. But you have to look for it. Okay. All right. Once we have... This yellow table, we got everything. We know what who our predictors are. Then you're going to move into the big step two, which is run regression. So let's look over real quick at this um, PDF, a model building strategy. So we've done one. We identified spending 2021 as a response variable. Step two, we grabbed all the reasonable predictors. They're already in our data anyway. We've, we cleaned the data. We did that back for exam one. We know, learned how to do that. Then um, we've run now correlations and scatter plots, and we figured out all the numerical predictors, the, the um, categorical. Once you have that table, by the way, this table, if there's any numerical, I mean, categorical ones in here, you got to build a dummy variable for it. So you need to know how to do that. Okay, then we're going to start with the full model. And so we're going to do that here. Oh, you're going to, all the data that you need that you end up having in this yellow in the table with the yellow, whatever variables end up as predictors, you're going to pull them into this regression data. So I started it for you. You're going to have response, and then you just pull in, copy in the data for every one of the predictors that ends up being in your table and anywhere in your table, whether it's the full model or swap out, right? And then we're going to start running regression models on that data. You're going to start with the full model. All right, so I started that for you. Run the full model. Then you're going to do step down. So remind, remember how to do the step down procedure. We're going to, right here, I'm looking at number five. The first thing we're going to do is check that the joint significance p-value is less than 0.05. If it is, you're good. You can keep moving. Then you look at the coefficients of the p-values. The coefficients p, the coefficients p -values. 
each of the predictor p-values, and you're going to drop the largest one if it's bigger than 0.05. Only drop one. Like you could have four or five that are all bigger than 0.05. Just drop the biggest one and, and then rerun the model that's reduced. You only drop one at a time because those those, all those numbers will change when you start dropping. Okay? Um, after you have all of them done, you're going to replace any multicollinear with the swap outs and see if the model improves. Okay, so you're going to run them that way as well. And then once you've gotten that far, hopefully you saw the video on 8.1 on the interaction, variable interactions. Once you're all the way down to your final reduced model with however many um, final predictors you have, then you want to run any interactions terms and see if that improves your model set. So um, that's basically the model, finding the best model, step down, swap outs, interactions. So you're going to work horizontally. You're going to have probably somewhere in the, depending everybody's different, but you probably somehow are between 12 to 20 models. As you start working them, they're, they're pretty easy to generate. Just remember your predictor data has to go in in one complete rectangle. So what you may need to do is come back over to this regression data and make copies of the predictor rectangle, including whatever predictors you want in there, okay? So then after you've got that, you're gonna go to this next tab, model results. And just like we've been doing in the videos and in the homework assignments so far, you're gonna put in here your identified top three models. So you're gonna put the predictors, coefficients, and p-values, then you're gonna get the goodness of fit statistics, the um, R squared, adjusted R squared, standard error. And this is where you're gonna do the head-to-head -head competition and figure out what's who's what's your top preferred model. For that top preferred model, just like you did in assignment eight, you're gonna interpret the coefficients on the predictors. And you wanna interpret that using the units uh, that the coefficients represent as rise over run. So I can tell you rise is uh, amount of dollars spent in, tw in 2021. What predicts it? You know, how much is it going to go up based on a one unit increase in that predictor? Okay. Once you have all that, you have your top preferred model. Then we're going to do the model assumption checks. So I would recommend you pull in your data here that you need. Like, let's say your final model only has two predictors. You just need the response and then the two predictors data or three predictors, whatever goes here. Then you're going to run a residual plots for that one and start checking, this is the table that we went over with the modeling assumptions. So you gotta fill that table out, just like I did in the video. Okay, we're gonna go through and check that. All right, if everything passes and it's looking acceptable, then you can declare your final model and have its own little worksheet. You know, you're gonna write the re regression equation, provide the table. So. Copy, when you look, go to this um, model results, copy the table. Was it model one, model two, or model three? Copy it over here to your final model. You've declared it. It wins. It looks good. Everything's ready to go with that final model. Then we're going to go into, so, okay, so we're going through this uh, instruction sheet kind of goes through and reminds you a little bit how to get there, fill out the table, run the residual plots, Interpret each coefficient. Okay. Um, once you're done, then we're going to do predictions using the final model for the two quartiles or two values, zero, one for the dummy variables of the predictor variables in the final model. And we're going to use those predictions to generate a 95% confidence, confidence interval, the average spending, and a 95% prediction interval. All right. So let me remind you how to do that. So once you have the final model, then we're going to do model predictions. So you're going to copy in here your predictor, your coefficients. So let's say we end up with a predictor one, predictor two. And let's say your third predictor turned out to be a dummy variable. All right. You got your, uh, you know, your coefficients. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're going to make predictions on the using the first quartile of the values for predictor one and the first quartile 
of the values for predictor two. And if it's a dummy variable, we're gonna do it at a zero. And then you're gonna come down here, use some product and get the predicted spending, okay? Then we're gonna do the same thing for the high values, but using the third quartile. And for the dummy variable, we'll go with one. So in one case, it's low across the board with all our predictors. The other case is high across the board with all our predictors. You can run other predictions, like if you think there's going to be something that's going to be made, maybe better and easier to, to present to Catherine Hill. You can, you know, write different numbers here. However, however many, whatever predictions you want to run, but this is the minimum. Okay, after you get that, then we're going to do the 95% confidence interval and 95% prediction intervals for the, the Q3 values. Okay, so if you need to remember how to do this, you can maybe put a note to yourself. This is um, found in slides uh, 7.1 part two is where I, I go over how to do this so you can remind yourself, but you're going to center. This is where we have to center and create new variables that are centered at those valuables. So we're gonna call it pred one star, predictor two star, and predictor three star. And then we got to center the data. So remember that data. So for the first one, it's going to equal the pred one original value minus the Q1 for pred one. Oh, sorry. If you put a little quote in front of the equal sign, you can actually type it in without it giving you an error. Okay, so I'm just kind of showing that's what you're going to do to get all your new data. I go through that in the slides. Um, and then you're going to run the linear regression on here. You're going to have to get your t-statistic and build your confidence interval. So I go over how to do that in those slides. Okay, so remind you how to do that. All right, so once you've done all of that, then you're now ready for strategies. So let's go back and read what the last part of this assignment entails. So it says the results from the regression analysis will be used to provide organic foods superstore at least one analytically supported suggestion to increase revenues. The suggestion or suggestions should be quantitatively defended, explain why they make sense based on the regression model and include specific references to the regression model results. All right, so you're gonna put, the, you're gonna write a little document. It doesn't have to be super long, but you wanna maybe cut and paste um, into this, the, you know, charts or whatever, the, the line plot. Remember the very last thing when you generate the residual plots, you, you do the, the line plots. Those are kind of like showing people like that it's working, the model's working. So you cut and paste those in there and just write it up, uh, write it out professionally in a document providing charts and or tables to support your suggestions. All right, so you're gonna upload that. So that's like your final thing, your final word on what you're gonna do.